Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Communicating and Connecting Safety Messages to Native American Communities, part of a long overdue conversation on reaching underserved communities to improve transportation safety. Today's webinar is hosted by the National Transportation Safety Board and will last approximately an hour and 45 minutes, hour and a half. I am Nicholas Worrell, the Chief of the Office of Safety Advocacy Division here at NTSB. As I said in our earlier webinars, we have to intentionally include underserved communities in order to not unintentionally exclude them. Today's webinar is about reaching Native American communities specifically. And we have opened this learning opportunity to other advocacy groups who want to learn and grow with us here at the NTSB. In our early seminars, we talked about the need to talk with people, not about them. The need to respect the diversity within each audience, the need to avoid stereotyping, and above all, the need to authentically communicate with other groups. We have also heard that often the messenger can be as important as the message. For the NTSB, we look to outside groups with expertise in connecting and communicating. With only a handful of safety advocacy staff out of a total of approximately 400 employees, NTSB advocates by collaborating with groups aligned with our safety issue, our safety recommendations. What should we and such partner groups know specifically about Native American communities? It's not just an academic question that I'm asking. According to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, 2022 annual report, those, those who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native are killed and injured at a rate of two or three times that of other ethnic groups. Motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of unintentional death for American Indians and Alaska Native ages 1 to 44. The 574 federally Recognized Native Alaskan and American Indian tribes are geogra geographically spread throughout the United States. Each tribe is unique in its heritage, language, and lifestyle. The lack of motor vehicle crash data and tribal reporting are areas of continual struggle contributing to the difficulty of reducing motor vehicle death among Native Americans. As we have done with our other communities, today we are asking how to reach Native American communities with the best safety messages and practices, how to identify and recognize transportation safety advocates to spread the best safety practices and messages to the grassroots. The administration, as I said in previous webinars, have recognized that the overall racial and ethnic diversity of, of our country continues to increase. Gaps in racial and ethnic equity persist. Recent executive order have sought to address these disparities. Today, our panelists will help us better understand what it takes to communicate and connect with them. Last month, the Federal Highway Administration announced almost 21 million in grant award for 88 tribal projects that will reduce roadway fatalities and serious injuries on tribal land throughout proven countermeasures in the bipartisan infrastructure law. These are direct measures. I invite panelists to feel free to discuss funding challenges in, traffic, in the traffic safety community as well. And I want to thank all of you, our panelists, and our panelists for taking the time out of your busy schedules to share and add value with us today. I'll briefly introduce them by, by their name, title, and a very brief, brief mini bio, but we will put their bios in the chat and it's on our event page on ntsb.gov for you to learn more about them. First, we'll hear from Tashina Ness, Multicultural Communication Manager for ICF Next. Tashina is a nine Navajo communication specialist with more than five years of experience in multicultural communication and advocacy for Native American and Alaska Native audience. Then we'll hear from Mary Maggie Gunno, Regional Six Director National Traffic Safety Administration. Dr. Gunnell oversees the Federal Highway Safety Program in Louisiana, Mississippi, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, and in the Indian Nations. Next, we'll hear from Lauren Sundara, Managing Director and Senior Strategist, 
strategist at Hendrick Marketing, a full service advertising agency headquarters in Denver, Colorado. Laura is a nationally recognized ethnic marketing expert and frequent keynote speaker at national conferences. Our final presenter will be Kobe, Cody Beers, a senior public relations specialist with the Wyoming Department of Transportation. He is Wydox liaison to the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes of the West River Reservation in central Wyoming. And to make sure that we are connecting with all of you, if you have questions, please enter them in the chat box. And once we, once our panelists have presented, we will take as many of your submitted questions as part of possible and have a wonderful interaction between you and the panelists. So without further ado, let's turn it over to our first panelist, Tashina Nath, Multicultural Communication Manager for ICF Next. Tashina. Hi, everybody. Okay. Yate, hello, everybody. My name is Tashina Nez. I am a Dine, uh, I am Dine, a member of the Navajo Nation. I work at ICF Next as a multicultural communication specialist. My focus is working with Native American and Alaska Native audiences. ICF Next is a global government consulting technology and innovation firm based in Reston, Virginia. My background is in public health. My current work focuses on communication and authentic engagement with Native American audiences. Naturally, much of the work that I do is still health related. Today, I'm excited to address the important topic, communicating and connecting safety messages to Native American communities. And I will be focusing on the foundational knowledge and the basics um, and the other wonderful panelists presenting after me today will cover more. So key points today for my section is first, Native people are diverse. We are not all the same. Second, historical events have lasting impacts on Native communities and we are modern people. Third, understand and respect tribal sovereignty. Fourth, have a sustainability mindset. <clears throat> really quickly, some definitions. So indigenous, indigenous communities are peoples with pre-existing sovereignty who were living together as a community prior to contact with settler populations, most often, although not exclusively, Europeans. And then Native American, uh, Native Americans, also sometimes referred to as American Indians, are members of any of the indigenous peoples of North, Central, and South America, especially those indigenous to what is now the continental U.S. And one thing that I'm going to state also is that we are people and we are not statistics. So keep that in mind as I go through this. So first, let's talk about identifying Native people. Identifying Native people is complex. There are so many tribes, and I will just cover the basics right now. So I want to make sure that you can communicate and speak with, uh, engage with Native people in a good way. So this, the title of the slide is We Are Not a Monolith, meaning that Native tribes are not all the same. Tribes are actually very diverse. When working with tribes, it is important to listen and ask first. How does the Native person that you are working with identify themselves and their community? For example, you can ask, how would you like for me to say the name of your Native community? Generally, it is safe to say Native community because it's specific enough to know that they know what you're asking for. And my answer to that question would be, you can call me Dene or you can call me Napo. Personally, both words are acceptable to me. Dene translates to the people in the Navajo language. And the word Navajo was a term that was forced onto us. But I acknowledge that it is more well known and it is also the official political name. So tribe names that we call ourselves and 
other names that have been forced onto us have stories and meaning behind them. That is why it is important to listen and ask first. There is no single Native American language. Native tribes are diverse in their languages and culture. Currently, there are 574 federally recognized tribes. And out of those 574, 229 of them are in Alaska. This means there's at least 540, um, 74 names for different tribe names. And that's not including um, names that we call ourselves. So the U.S. federally recognized tribes have legal agreements such as treaties with the United States federal government that enforces a nation-to-nation relationship. Tribal nations are sovereign nations with their own rights to self-governance. For example, on the Navajo Nation, we have our own Navajo Nation president, and I am both a citizen of the Navajo Nation and a citizen of the United States. There are approximately 324 federal land areas, um, Indian land areas in the United States. Reservations are just one type of land area that are reserved for tribes to use. This designation is usually through the treaties and some reservations are located on ancestral lands while others are placed uh, are places that tribes were forcibly relocated to by the US federal government. And we will cover a little bit more about this in the next se- se- section. So first, tribal sovereignty gets its own slide because it's just that important. Um, And tribal sovereignty is important to understand for proper tribal engagement. The 574 federally recognized tribes have a nation to nation relationship with the federal government and individual states must respect tribes as nations as well. Federally recognized tribes maintain the right to govern themselves Each tribal nation determines their own government structure, so the governmental structures are different from tribe to tribe. Since there's so many tribes, I personally don't know the governmental structure of all all 574 of them. So as an example for the Navajo Nation, just because that's where I'm from, (laughs) I can share about it. Um, Other tribes will do things differently, like I said. So on the Navajo Nation, we have our elections and then we vote for our Navajo Nation president and we have uh, different representatives and local leadership to represent us. One way to think of this concept of tribal sovereignty is to, um, when engaging with tribes, remember to respect that tribe, respect tribal lands as if you are visiting a foreign country. It is best to always consider tribal sovereignty when working with tribes. If you don't, you may encounter issues such as needing to ask for deadline extensions due to tribes' political, cultural, or social approval processes that you may not have been aware of. So it's important to, of course, communicate with the people that you're working with. And this is just a photo of the seal of the Navajo Nation. So I'm going to provide some brief historical context because it is important. So as I continue, um, I ask everyone in the audience to please seek to understand before judging any indigenous uh, concepts or practices that I mentioned today. Um, This history is not the same for all Native people. So this is just a very basic overview. I encourage you to learn more about the specific tribes in your area and their history because it's very important. So in a normal friendship, people generally take the time to have conversations with each other to get to know each know each other a lot better and establish a good relationship. So making that same effort to learn about foundational things before engaging with native communities will similarly help to build a better relationship with tribes. Before trying to start a partnership with a tribe, it is good to be mindful of that tribe's history. This provides a foundation to build on 
and helps to avoid burdening Native people by over-questioning them and to avoid being unintentionally offensive. You don't need to know everything about a specific tribe's past, but be aware of the historical contexts and how they affect the Native people in modern day. First, different tribes have different experiences with colonization, and I will not be covering all experiences and all histories, all histories today. This is just a brief overview, as I said. <clears throat> I strongly recommend going over this um, on your own when you have more time. So these are federal policies that have happened. So starting in 1830, there was the Indian Removal Act that granted lands west of the Mississippi River in exchange for Indian lands, leading to the U.S. government's forced removal and relocation of many tribes. <clears throat> the bottom part, I talk about um, Navajo history specifically, but that's just because I'm Navajo. It'll vary. And then from in the mid-1800s, there was the Indian boarding schools where the U.S. government or Christian missionaries forcibly removed children from their home and made them, forced them to attend uh, government schools for the purpose of assimilation. And in this photo, you can see that a person before who was in the traditional regalia, they got their hair cut and they were forced to wear Western clothing. And then in um, around 1956, the American Indian Urban Relocation Program created by the Bureau of Indian, Fa Indian Affairs offered assistance to Native people to move to metropolitan areas to assimilate them as well. And this led to unemployment, discrimination, and loss of cultural support. So as you can see, this is just very brief, and I encourage you to learn more about it. We have strong ties to the land, generally. I have to say some, not all, because we are not a monolith. And please be respectful of closed practices. Some traditional and ceremonial practices are, um, if you're not a part of that tribe, you're just simply not allowed to um, know about it. So please be respectful of that. Don't try to probe and don't try to keep asking questions about it. Um, so another thing is that sometimes indigenous knowledge can conflict with Western society and Western social socialization. So there's different things to have additional conversations about. And if a tribe ever says no to something, please understand that they have very good and many reasons to say no, and just please respect that. Okay, the basics, get to know the community, learn about demographics. Does your community speak English? What other languages do they speak? Do they speak their indigenous language? Um, those are very important. So try your best to use plain language in your communications. Learn about what types of resources they have and how you can be supportive with what they have and what your goals are and try to align them to make a good partnership. And as I mentioned with the historical context, I have that slide just to inform why some tribes might be more distrustful than others when it comes to working with outside organizations. So please keep those things in mind. Now, I'm going to talk about engaging and communicating next. So when working with Native tribes, please be careful to maintain trust. This means um, build a, focus on building a healthy relationship and make sure you're doing your actions. You're, yeah, you're purposeful in the actions that you're taking. Focus on strengths. So Try to get out of that disparity mindset and try to focus on what strengths uh, 
people have because that's more of the modern thing. <clears throat> Again, partnership is crucial and relationship building. Understand how much mistrust there is and how ways to go about remedying that. Now, I want to focus <clears throat> I want to focus on number 6 that I have bolded. So have a plan to engage long term. So it it's actually a pet peeve to some tribes when outside entities do not plan for sustainability and tribes do not want to create a relationship, do a project and then be left with scraps or leftovers. They do not want to have a project fail in the long term due to poor sustainability after an outside organization can leave. Um, it is better to have a plan for long ter a long-term standing partnership before trying to work with any tribes to um, keep good tribal relations. Communicating. <clears throat> so always ask permission for any communications and, and get approval for everything. This is a lot easier to do when you have a good partnership with the tribe because you will already have people representing that tribe who can tell you, yes, do this, don't do this, this is what we recommend. And listening to the tribe and always getting those approvals is a way to show that you are respecting tribal sovereignty. Again, use plain language. Oh, sorry. Um, this is really important. Use modern day representations in your photos. Try to avoid using historical um, photos because we are a modern people with modern lives. Um, that's the main thing. And then always make sure you're um, representing the correct tribe. So make sure that you're not showing the wrong tribe's photos for um, a completely different tribe. Okay, now key points again, tribes are diverse. History is important to understand, but we are modern people and always respect tribal sovereignty and have a sustainable, sustainability mindset. And then I'll leave you with this last tip that is crucial. If you take anything away from my presentation, if you really care about connecting with tribes, when you find yourself working with any state, local, or federal government, or public service, including your own organizations, and you look around and there are no tribes represented, ask them, what about the tribes? That will really help you become best friends with tribes. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Maggie next. Well, thank you, Tashina. And that was just terrific. I, I know um, I really appreciate you sharing all that. I know I always learn something and absolutely did today. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Maggie Gunnels from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And I'd like to thank Chief Worrell and the National Transportation Safety Board and, of course, all our expert panelists here today. Um, and it's this is a really important dialogue we're about to have, and I really appreciate the opportunity to represent NHTSA and be part of that. And I know my hope, I think our hope really is that we can convey some, some strategies and some examples of things that work. And we hope that these will result in safer people, safer roads, safer speeds, and safer vehicles. And many of you may recognize that those are critical elements of the safe system approach, which is a key strategy incorporated within the United States Department of Transportation National Roadway Safety Strategy. And so today, there are four concepts or strategies that I will focus on, and I'm actually going to echo uh, one uh, very intentionally that Tashina um, shared with us just a moment ago. Um, and so I'll talk about those in just a moment. And I did want to mention that I think it's so important that we um, consider what we've heard and what we'll hear today, because all of these lessons really guide us to really making those connections. Um, and I think connecting is, is really the key here. Communication must be effective, but it's about the connection. 
So um, these four concepts or themes are important elements of, of what we use in our work. And again, acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty. Um, we're a federal agency, but from everyone who works um, with Native American communities, this again is so critical as you've already heard today. Understanding the specific tribe or tribes you want to reach. And of course, culturally appropriate language and messaging. Language does matter. Um, and thinking about partnerships and how partnerships really leverage uh, our opportunities um, to work better um, with tribes. I wanted to begin, if I could, with a, just a brief uh, discussion of uh, NHTSA's work with tribal nations, beginning with our, our uh, uh, highway safety grant programs, so that we are all, I'm not sure everyone is familiar with NHTSA, um, so I thought I'd get started with that. And we work closely with the Department of the Interior Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, we do this in accordance with federal statute and the administration of grant funds um, that we award to individual tribal nations. Um, in 2023, NHTSA awarded a little over $8 million for the purpose uh, of addressing road user behavioral safety challenges in tribal communities. So there are some, here's some examples of the types of, of work that we fund and do, uh, traffic law enforcement, uh, community education, uh, child passenger safety education. And we also most, very importantly, I believe, um, work uh, to help develop and sustain uh, child passenger safety technician training and child safety seat distribution within Native American community, within Native American communities, as well as um, assisting with safety messaging. Um, and, and that um, may include things like developing storytelling uh, messaging. So those are some examples of the types of work that we fund. Um, and I don't know if you're aware, but NHTSA does have a tribal working group led by our stakeholder engagement specialists. And we have offices across the country. There are 10 regional offices. And we work around the country as well as with key offices at our headquarters. And I hope that many of you have had an opportunity to meet Assistant Secretary Arlando Teller and Director Marla Booth, who lead our Office of Tribal Affairs that's within the Office of the Secretary of Transportation. And of course, we work closely with the Federal Highway Administration and all of the uh, United States Department of Transportation uh, agencies to ensure that our grants and programs work in a complementary fashion. So that's, that's sort of a framework for where we begin. So first, I'd like to, of course, acknowledge tribal sovereignty. And thank you so much, Tashina. That was a, such an important um, explanation um, that you did about the 574 federally recognized tribes. And of course, tribes live from Florida to, to Alaska with a great proportion, as you know, um, being from and in Alaska. Um, the land size, the population, the government structure, and the cultural practices vary greatly. And of critical importance is the self-governance within the tribes, where um, laws are established within their own jurisdictions. Because tribes are not a subdivision or affiliated with a federal or state government, they are governments. So that's really critical to think about when you're doing programs and also to think about whether or not there might be traffic safety laws that are sustained or might not even be present in a tribal community. Tribes are empowered, of course, to make their own decisions about what is best for their communities and, and are acknowledged in the Constitution and their authorities established through treaties, statutory law, and the United States Supreme Court decisions. So when, when we, when an outside governmental entity wish to engage with a tribe, it's so important that we are, we are communicating through the lens of government to government. And these relationships take time to establish and they're based on mutual respect. So tribal sovereignty is critically important. Second, to expound a bit upon um, Tashina's um, point about understanding the tribe or the tribal nation, before we engage with a tribe, we do research, we 
spend time looking at the history. We want to recognize the uniqueness of that tribe and, and frankly, honor the tribe. Um, it's really important because a tribe, for example, in the Pacific Northwest may be very different from one in the southeastern part of the of, of the United States, such as the Miccosukee. So it, many tribes do have um, official websites. They have social media. You can oftentimes find really important information about history and structure, cultural practices and programs, just by doing some research and informing yourself. So reviewing this information will educate yourself and those with whom you work um, and inform your approach about contacting tribal officials. And when you're thinking about traffic safety, for example, ask the question, does the tribe have a transportation department, a police department? Is there a public health department? What is the structure of the tribe? And who are you trying to reach? And so as you complete your research and get to know a little bit more about the tribe, think about what the key issues are in that, in that particular community and what are the safety priorities. And as mentioned already, uh, many tribes hold cultural celebrations during specific times of year. So recognize that tribal officials may be busy. They may not be available or have time to meet with you. Or if you've already presented an idea or had a discussion, it may take some time to hear back. And that's perfectly acceptable and reasonable. In addition to to websites and those types of things. When you're looking at social media accounts in Native American communities, think about the community announcements and you might learn a little bit more about the lay of the land or the lay of the roads, really the safety issues by looking at these announcements about construction and weather and some of the safety challenges that, that are being faced. So all of this information can be very important when informing uh, your approach and, and how to best meet the needs of the tribes. And, and I know that we, when speaking to tribal officials, we use official titles. Um, we understand and ask about the names that are supposed to be used and are very respectful of that and tribal sovereignty. Um, I, would, I would say a lesson we've learned that's very important is to be patient. We can offer information, data, programs, things like this, but expect this, this to take time and consider um, and be considered by perhaps a higher level council. So a brief email or phone call is okay for an introduction, but that doesn't work when you're trying to rush in and, and make something happen. And I really appreciate Tashina's point about sustainability. It's, it's a long-term relationship. It's not a short-term relationship. So again, allow sufficient time to develop that relationship. And, um, and or whether you're having a leadership meeting, events or partnership activities, um, request always to meet in person at a time and place that's convenient and be ready to listen understand their view and concerns. And one example to provide to you might be that we often will uh, ride out with law enforcement officers so uh, to understand better what the roads are like and what the challenges they face are when we're looking at what types of programs might be best for that community. And I would say be patient um, when responding and allow time to have a, a dialogue. There's no rushing necessary, but just take time to understand and recognize that um, it may take a, 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 a bit of time to communicate um, when you're seeking an agreement and you're looking to make that connection. And again, looking for the long-term relationship. So third, we'd li I'd like to mention the, the, um, the really important notes we've received about culturally appropriate safety messaging. And, and in this case, language really does matter. And certainly images are included in that. Um, language and imaging are really critical to communication strategies. And you'll hear more about that in, in just a moment. Um, but I know the polished look of our traditional general market messages, I think we all know, they really may not resonate with a particular tribe or community. And a positive reinforcement of social norms is likely to receive be received better as compared to something that's more punitive or, or enforcement focused. So we typically will appeal to community safety 
um, to advance the preservation of the tribe, to empower the next generation, and to really focus on um, an empowered future um, that, that can work in that particular community. And as Tashina mentioned, it's so important to craft safety messages and consult tribal officials, tribal members, when you're looking at those messaging and seek their input. And you can offer to feature tribal members, members in um, the messaging. Um, or if you're doing media productions and things, you can hire Native American actors and always compensate people for their time, individuals, actors, and whoever participates for the time and effort, just as you would if you were doing a traditional media production. And then the fourth point is really about leveraging partnerships. And, and partnerships are the foundation for much of what we do. Partnership opportunities can be strengthened and created, especially when there's a shared vision of safety within uh, a tribal community. Partnerships um, really help bring that connection uh, and make it happen. Um, and so everyone's working toward the same mission and the same goals. And I'd like to offer just a couple of examples of things that, that we have done at our agency that you could think about if you're about to approach a, a, a tribal community um, and um, or if you're interested in working with us on something, which could be possible as well. We're happy to, do, to, to talk to you about that as well. So we've we've hosted things like over the past number of years, we've hosted um, educational webinars. We've funded uh, many different types of tribal safety activities and programs. I hope that some of you on this call might have been at the Tribal Motor Vehicle Safety Summit in Denver, where we partnered with the Tribal Injury Prevention Resource Center to talk about motor vehicle safety. We did that uh, last year. Um, and we sponsored recently in the spring an education and outreach activity at the Gathering of Nations, which is a wonderful opportunity for engagement um, with tribes. And our regional offices from coast to coast really do stand ready to work with tribal communities or those interested in working with tribal communities on highway safety initiatives and priorities. A few more examples might be our grant programs through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, the Indian Highway Safety Program. For example, tribes are able to ask for assistance with grant writing, technical assistance, as well as um, participate in periodic grant writing workshops. We held two of these last year, one in Denver, one in Albuquerque, and those are at no cost to participants. We also can provide uh, data assessments. So, uh, and as has been mentioned and probably will continue to be mentioned, there's a challenge in data collection and data analysis and understanding the traffic safety issues with the Native American communities. But we do have a team that will do a assessment of traffic safety data and systems. And that helps not only pinpoint pinpoint emerging safety issues, but it might also help with other types of grant applications. And finally, just a couple of more examples include our educational webinars, and we have an upcoming one uh, in November on vehicle safety with the Tribal Entry Prevention Resource Center, and that will be focused on uh, things like making your vehicle safe, um, checking for recalls, and of course those can be repaired at no cost. To, to the person um, that is uh, that is participating. And then we have traffic safety campaign materials, digital social media, and a number of uh, resources online that can be used. And we do um, want to mention especially that there is a significant need for child passenger safety instructors and technicians to be trained and who can serve Indian country. So talk to us. We're glad to look for partnerships and how to improve um, the cadre of um, instructors and technicians um, across, across Indian country. And again, I did mention that we have 10 regional offices across the country that really want to serve Native American communities, and we want to um, reduce the crashes, the injuries, and the deaths that we see on our roads. So in closing, I'd just like to really echo again the four very important concepts and the lessons we've learned over the years. Um, tribal sovereignty is critical to connecting with Native American communities and attention to government structure, 
um, governments, the cycle of governments, and who's leading the tribal governments, which change typically, as you've heard, um, is very important when you're doing engagement activities and looking to sustain those activities. Second, take time to understand the tribe you want to learn about and with whom you want to engage. And each tribe is unique. Um, and that really under, underscores really the importance of specific safety messaging strategies that incorporate cultural differences and, and sensitivities. Third, ensure your safety messages, your images, your communication strategies are culturally appropriate, specific, and relative to that tribe. And then fourth, um, Partnerships are really important in working in Native American communities, and these really are a foundation for connecting with members of Native American communities, and we're happy to collaborate with you. So I hope those have helped a bit, and it's really been a pleasure to share our experiences and our perspective in communicating and connecting safety messages to tribal communities. We really appreciate this opportunity, and I know we all want to reduce and frankly, end deaths and injuries and crashes on our roads. So thank you. And it's my uh, great pleasure uh, to uh, hand the virtual microphone, if you will, over to our colleague, Laura Sundrup, who is an expert in safety messaging. So off to you, Laura. Maggie, thank you so much. I will take a quick second to get my slides ready to go. There we go. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today uh, while we share some of our insights and experiences with you. I'm particularly glad to have an opportunity to share with each of you today the insights that my team and I have gathered over, over, over 14 years of working collaboratively with members of the Standing Rock, Spirit Lake, Turtle Mountain, Three Affiliated, Eastern Shoshone, Northern Arapaho, Ute Mountain Ute, and Southern Ute tribal communities as they endeavor to reduce injuries and fatalities on their respective roadways. While I do not identify as an indigenous woman, I am a marketing professional who strives to deliver respectful, relevant, and most important, results-oriented outcomes. So let's get started. Today, we'll have two of us actually speaking from within the same deck. I'll take part one. Cody Beers from YDOT will take over at the end of my slides. So when we think about message development, and you've heard a little bit of this from Toshina and Maggie both today, ownership is absolutely key to successful campaign deliverables. Members must be active participants in the message development process. There's no other way to approach this. You've also heard some references to language. We know that in some of the 574 communities, the use of native language is declining. So keeping those words alive is particularly important. And we have discovered such amazing opportunities in the tribal communities with whom we've partnered to work with elders to translate the traffic safety messages. It is just such an incredible experience to have the privilege to hear their stories as they work to translate the traffic safety messages into their native languages. So do not, I'm just encouraging you, do not overlook that opportunity. And then finally, we've talked a little bit already about identification and proper use of tribe-specific icons. So as we start to show you some of the creative examples with the hope of inspiring some, some creative ideas of your own, you'll see a theme of featuring families, sacred landscapes, in some cases, customs and symbols 
and regalia. I also want to encourage you to go into this process knowing that flexibility is key. This is an example of a member of the uh, one of the Wind River tribal communities who also happens to be a school principal. We wanted to do a radio spot with him. He was thrilled. He was a partner in the script development, but he could not get away from school to go to a studio to record. So guess what? We brought the studio to him. That's the sort of flexibility we need to be keeping top of mind. We've also talked a little bit, Toshina and Maggie both mentioned the importance of ceremonies. So Going to powwows, for example, can be an awesome opportunity, not only to help individuals who do not identify as Indigenous um, learn more about their, their neighbors, but it also can give you an awesome opportunity to get photographs to use in future traffic safety messaging couple of things to think about. I think Toshina mentioned some of the tribal ceremonies are off limits. So always ask permission. This should be part of an ongoing conversation that you're having with members of the tribal communities with whom you're working. Ask if you might attend this event. After you've gotten permission to attend the event, then it's also critical to ask permission of the individuals that you may be taking photographs of. I think Maggie mentioned the importance of compensating. So that absolutely, you have to have a budget item in your creative process to ensure that we're properly compensating the individuals with whom we're partnering for creative development. So specifically today, I did name, because I think it's important to name each of the tribal communities with whom we've worked, but you'll see that some of these uh, projects have been as part of a contract with Region 8, NHTSA Region 8. We've also worked with the Wyoming Department of Transportation, as well as the Colorado Department of Transportation. So let's get started and take a look at some of the work that we've done in partnership with four of the tribal communities in North Dakota. You'll see first thing as you start to look at some of this creative that um, as we Toshina and Maggie both mentioned, it is critical. We never ever want to use stock images. It is critical that we're showing the tribes, individuals from within their communities, respected members of the tribal council, of law enforcement, of health care, educators, all of those individuals have a story to tell. And I believe it's our obligation to give them that voice. So what you will see as we go through a lot of this creative, these are not headlines that my creative team has written. These are not creative concepts that we've developed. This is what we've done as an aspect of listening. It is so critical to listen, to sit and talk with individuals, to talk with these two gentlemen who are part of law enforcement and hear what their opinions are. Where do they think the biggest opportunity is? And then to take their words and put those words into the creative. Here are a couple of other examples, one featuring um, members of law enforcement from one of the other tribal communities. You'll also see in both of these that native language has been used within the copy in the, the ad. Um, the one on the right, we will be known forever by the tracks we leave. The Dakota proverb that one of the tribal members brought to my attention during our conversations and just being able to utilize those insights from the members of the communities with whom you're working is critical to effective message development. It's another example. All 
Okay, so let's transition for a moment to our work with the communities comprised within the Pine Ridge Reservation. And as got a map on here for you, just so that you're sure where Pine Ridge is located. Um, so lower part of South Dakota on the Nebraska border. <clears throat> so a couple of examples of some drinking and driving messaging featuring families who were on that particular day participating in powwows. And then a buckle up message as well. Now we'll move a little further south down to Colorado to the Southern Ute and Ute Mountain communities. You might recall a few slides back talking about sacred landscapes. This is certainly a great example of the feedback that we received in those conversations with our contacts at the Ute Mountain community, that there are some landscapes, there are some, some views within the reservation that are particularly important to the members of the community and are considered sacred. So having that insight when we're trying to determine appropriate images for billboards in this example is critical. And again, you really have to depend on those community members to give you those meaning full insights. And another example showing sacred landscapes in a billboard on the Ute Mountain Ute Tribes Reservation. Um, Ute Mountain, as you can, if, you, if you'll use your imagination a little bit, you'll be able to see within this mountain range um, the, the sleeping Ute. And, and so again, an example of using a sacred landscape in a bumper sticker, as well as you'll notice along the bottom, that is a pottery design. The black and white design is um, really important to the Ute Mountain community, and they're very well known for their beautiful pottery. So being able to, again, introduce a relevant image that says, to the tribal community members, hey, this message is for me. I see myself and my family and my community in this message. And then also working with the folks at KSUT, uh, a radio station um, with affiliated with the Southern Ute community is equally important. So you've seen a lot of print and billboards simply because those are the easiest things to show you in a, in a webinar. Um, but it's also important to think about what are those other messaging opportunities that might be available to you within the tribal community. So maybe there is a reservation station that you could be running traffic safety messages on. And again, talking with those individuals, working directly with them on production, on script development. It is amazing the insights that you can glean from those respectful relationships. So strongly encourage you to consider that as an option. And then we'll head back up north just a bit to Wyoming and talk about the Wind River Reservation. We have both the Northern Arapaho and the Eastern Shoshone tribes are both a part of the Wind River Reservation. So always making sure that we're talking to those individuals, those families, those business leaders, the tribal leaders representing both of those communities is key. Another thing that's key and we've talked a bit about this. So, so I hope you're, you're listening and, and thinking about how you can do this within your own state or within your own community. But the importance of listening. So we frequently do tribal surveys. We do listening sessions because, again, it's so critical to hear what people are thinking and then take that information and put it back out into the community in a meaningful way in an effort to reduce those roadway injuries and fatalities. So here are a couple of examples of billboards that 
actually have quotes that we gathered in listening sessions from respected tribal members. So they really, truly have a voice in this case, and their names are associated with those messages. Here are two other examples of messages that came out of those surveys and listening sessions. We know that pedestrian safety is very, very important. So hearing what an individual tribal member is saying, be seen, be safe, your life depends on it. Literally using those words is a critical part of effective message development. And I'll share with you a couple of other examples. We're going to hear from Cherokee Brown, uh, this woman in just a moment um, in a video that she's going to talk a little bit about uh, loss that her family experienced. And you'll notice in this case, there have been some instances where we've led with English followed up by native language. This is a nice example of leading strongly with native language and then English secondarily, all driven by tribal input. So I've got a couple of videos I'd like to share with you. My name is Emeryal Lebeau. I'm a finance director for the Northern Rapala Tribal Housing. I also serve on the Fremont County School District 14. I am also a board member for the Wind River Development Fund. The road we're standing on is known as Blue Sky Highway. This road is special to me because I use it every day to transport my kids to school, practice, games, as well as getting myself to work. It's the lifeline of our community here. It's the pathway to success for our community. This community is made up of grandmothers, aunts, uncles, moms, fathers, and our precious children. If you were to drive impaired, I would ask, why would you risk all of that? We care about each other here, and we wouldn't want anything bad to happen. There are 33,000 miles of roads in Wyoming. This one's mine. Don't go down that road. All right. I have another video to share with you. I mentioned just a moment ago, you saw uh, this member of the community featured in a billboard, Creative Execution. Let's take a listen to hear about the loss that her family experienced. Killer was supposed to meet us for a family gathering on the ceremony that night. We always went over the make sure you have your seatbelt on, but it never crossed my mind that she was raising her vehicle. Killer had a smile that could just brighten up any. She could go from playing a game on the court at state, going straight from the court to the runway. She was just free. Her spirit was so free. We don't leave the driveway if the seatbelts are not on. But what I realize, it doesn't really matter. It could be 50 yards down the road and you can get killed. Taylor was less than a mile from where she was going from her grandma's house. If she had had her seatbelt on that day, I believe she'd still be here. I wouldn't wish anybody to feel this kind of pain. Kids being kids just playing in the backyard and not laying in the field dead. I don't get to watch her play basketball for college. That was her dream. And she never made it her So, and then the final video that I'll share with you um, is one that we partnered with Indigenous youth on the reservation to help us produce. And if there's anything I can leave you with today, it's what's on this slide. Let's think proactively about engaging tribal youth, not only as a means of reducing injuries and fatalities on our roadways, but as a means of developing the next generation of transportation experts 
within our tribal communities. All right, we're on the home stretch. Cody, get ready to, uh, to jump in. Uh, a couple more examples. Um, this particular execution with the headline, Up Tough Guy, as you can see, this one was translated. And I would say historically speaking, for, for the 14 years that we've been working with the Wind River Reservation, this has probably been the most impactful campaign and in fact, those of you who are on the call who are in marketing, you probably appreciate that most of the time when we see crossover, how does crossover happen? It's typically when a really solid concept starts with general marketing, and then what do we do? We adapt it to diverse communities, right? Well, I am so proud that in this case, we turned that on its ear. We took a very strong tribal message and we crossed it back over to general market. So that's the sort of progress that we want to see. Now, as I wrap up, I think that um, Toshina or Maggie had mentioned something about being very careful with historical images. And I want all of us to respect that advice. I also want to use this particular concept as an example of what can I do now? Maybe, well, fiscal year 24 funding, you probably don't have it just yet. So you're already thinking about what can I do right now? I'm hopeful that you've been inspired by some of the things that you've heard on today's call uh, in our conversations. So what are some steps that you might be able to take? And this is a perfect example that I can use to answer that question. The very first year, that we worked cooperatively with YDOT on the Wind River Reservation. We were there for a week in meetings with the tribal council, with business leaders, with moms and dads, talking about what a traffic safety messaging campaign could look like. And as part of that sort of get to know you of conversations, mm -hmm. one of the tribal leaders <clears throat> me to tour the museum that is on the reservation. And as she was guiding me through the exhibits and we were talking, I happened to see this image of this mother and child hanging on a wall. And so she and I stopped, we talked a little bit about this message and being a creative, working for an agency, I immediately thought about the connection between then and now, and that tribal mothers and fathers have been transporting their children safely forever. Putting them in a car seat isn't really a new message. It's a new way to transport, but the idea of transporting and caring for our children is not a new idea. So as she and I talked of course, I asked for permission. I literally snapped a picture of the picture hanging on the wall in the museum on my phone, brought it back to the creative team and said, what can we do with this? So here is, in my opinion, a really respectful, informed use of a historical image that connects what we what what the tribal communities have been doing with what we're asking them to do today and that is to make sure that their little ones their <clears throat> little ones are being properly restrained so i'm hopeful that that this shows you a way to maybe get started in an unexpected way that really doesn't take much of a budget so to recap the biggest thing I can leave you with, and again, you've heard this from several other speakers, and Cody may even uh, weigh in on this as well, 
Tribal members must be a part of any message development undertaking without exception. And when you listen and you listen for meaning and you listen for intent and you listen to hear some of those cultural nuances, you're going to do a great job with developing messaging for use in reducing injuries and fatalities. Cody, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. And uh, I can't uh, say anything but wow after uh, following this amazing group of people. Um, I'm going to say many of the same things that uh, that they have said. Um, uh, my name's Cody Beers. Um, my family um, were longtime ranchers on the Wind River Reservation. Um, so you may uh, you may be wondering why a uh, middle-aged white guy is is sitting here uh, speaking to you about how to communicate with uh, Native American tribes. Well, it's been uh, part of my family's history for uh, about 80 years, um, and I'm a, uh, a fortunate person to have had grandparents like mine who um, lived and worked successfully on uh, the Wind River Reservation. Um, it helped me to... Uh, have some credibility up front, that street cred that we're all looking for um, out in our communities. Um, and uh, on a place like uh, Wind River Reservation that is uh, right smack dab in the middle of the state, um, it's a reservation that uh, um, takes up about 2.2 million acres. And it's shared by two tribes, uh, the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho. Um, which is a unique situation in the United States um, um, that is the only reservation um, that is shared by two uh, different tribes and two sovereign nations uh, who uh, speak uh, two different languages, who have two different tribal governments and uh, that we work with at YDOT um, because transportation in a rural state like Wyoming is so critical and it's so critical um, on Wind River. And you'll hear me say on Wind River. And that when I say that, I'm, I'm speaking of the Wind River Reservation, which is right outside my window here at my office. So um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, how we've approached uh, our long-term relationship with the, uh, um, the tribes on Wind River. Um, and I will say it's long-term because I'm not the first one who's done this work. Uh, we've had, uh, we've had a, a series of folks through the years who have, uh, who've had this relationship, even though, um, I would tell you my, my relationship is unique to all of them because, um, because of my family history and, and also because of what I do outside of uh, the Wyoming Department of Transportation when I, I've had the opportunity to, uh, to work with tribes. I've done that. Um, and uh, I also do it on the uh, sports uh, activities of the Wind River Reservation. And I'm currently in my 10th year as the uh, voice of the Wyoming Indian Chiefs uh, basketball teams who have been uh, very successful in girls basketball and boys basketball. And, and that has continued to develop my uh, trust base uh, friendship with both tribes. Um, today, we want to talk about some of the things we do. And uh, it's very important that uh, in Wyoming that we've partnered with these uh, two tribes um, to improve the road structure um, on the reservation and to talk about the four E's, uh, things we've done through our marketing campaigns, uh, working with a fabulous uh, um, contractor being uh, Laura Sondra up in Hispani Dodd and also known as Heinrich Marketing. Um, education has been a big deal and emergency services, uh, enforcement of uh, both uh, 
uh, tribal code and Wyoming state law and U.S. Uh, U.S. codes uh, is an important thing. And then, of course, engineering. How do we improve uh, roads and bridges? Basically, uh, within a sovereign nation, uh, we do have state highways that uh, go through Wind River. We have a U.S. highway that goes through Wind River, but we also have many tribal roads which feed as uh, collector roads and allow the tribal people to get uh, to to uh, schools, to church, uh, to get off the reservation, to get uh, medical services, uh, to get a number of uh, things, and then just like us, to get out and enjoy the world. Um, uh, so to speak. So with that, uh, Laura, let's, uh, let's move on to our next slide. Um, YDOT, uh, I believe, is relatively unique because we are so rural in Wyoming. And then we've got uh, Fremont County, which uh, Wind River is uh, totally located inside of. Uh, Fremont County, Wyoming is in the top 10 as far as land areas for counties in the United States, and uh, it is about roughly the size of Vermont. And so then you plunk down uh, the Wind River Reservation inside of Fremont County, and you've got uh, areas that are um, many miles apart. And, uh, and you know, a ride into town from uh, the middle of Wind River is 25 to 40 miles often. And so uh, very spread out, a lot of driving, and that's why transportation becomes such an important part of the culture on Wind River and many of the rural reservations throughout the American West and other places. So what we have tried to do at YDOT is to use positive messaging and a community-based model um, as a way to change behavior. Uh, we use Native American voices, Native American images. Uh, you'll never see Cody Beers, the white guy, delivering uh, these messages, except maybe on the radio, um, along with uh, the many friends uh, that I've uh, been fortunate to accumulate through the years on Wind River and the many acquaintances who have uh, pointed me in this direction or that direction as a way to uh, tell Wind River story. So, um, one of the things that I strongly believe in, and I think you'll fail if you try to uh, um, promote safety on a, on a reservation, on a uh, tribal nation uh, where tribal sovereignty is so important, is that the tribal community must carry that traffic safety messaging to their families, to their friends, their coworkers uh, for way too long. Um, these communities have have been told um, what to do by uh, uh, the American government and uh, white white eyes like me, and so uh, they want to uh, um, set their own course for safety. They want to save their lives on their own, and and they want to speak to their own people. And so I think everything we have done has. Uh, lent into that strength. Uh, and we've had great partnerships um, by doing that. So um, we have continued to evolve our messaging through time uh, with uh, the, the landmark messaging that we still use, and that is uh, seatbelt use, uh, promoting that as uh, the first and most important thing to do when you climb inside of a vehicle. And also we have continued to work on uh, what is what has often been a tragic story and that's people uh, losing their lives, being, being injured um, um, because of uh, the use of uh, alcohol and drugs and then, uh, and then combining that with lack of seatbelt use and driving vehicles. And then, uh, you know, I'm proud to say this has been a long-term um, effort, a sustained effort, um, thanks to a continuing uh, a great relationship with an outstanding uh, world-class uh, marketing agency who specializes in these areas of, of safe uh, discussions 
um, safe, relevant messaging, um, being culturally sensitive uh, to messaging um, on Wind River and throughout Fremont County, because we are a big community of about 45,000 people and 21% of our population in this county is Native American. So uh, we were represented by Native Americans in the Wyoming State Legislature. And uh, these same Native Americans are, uh, you know, representing their people on their, on their own business council. So you'll see, and you may have noticed in Laura's slides that uh, we, we often use an intertribal approach to messaging on Wind River because of the two tribes and uh, transportation is one of those functions of both tribes uh, that allows us um, to speak to everyone on Wind River. So let's move ahead to our next slide. Um, education is big. Um, when we first started working with uh, Heinrich Marketing in 2009, uh, we spent a lot of time talking uh, first, uh, the first time I met Laura was at a conference in Utah, and we sat and, and just uh, talked about uh, uh, life on Wind River. Um, she shared messages for me and, and information about what was happening on other reservations. And, uh, you know, we began talking about uh, how do we develop messaging uh, for tribal safety? Um, um, talks and I guess the the first thing that uh, we both agreed on is that we wanted to take this to the grassroots level on this reservation uh, in Wyoming and find out um, what the issues are from the tribal perspective and I think that has helped us more than anything we've done. Um, we've kept our messages um, um, centered around cultural identity. Uh, we've uh, ran the messages by our tribal councils. We've asked for their help. They've helped us develop these messages. Um, and number one, we've listened. Um, something I've heard throughout this uh, uh, presentation today that it's very important to listen. When I say listen, I mean listen to understand. Um, that is very important. When you, when you listen to respond um, to uh, most people, and I get very frustrated. Uh, I work in an agency full of engineers who uh, who already think they know the answers to things without listening to understand. Um, and it's very important to do that in a cultural environment too, like Wind River. Um, allow people to talk. And when they pause, understand that they're probably not finished talking yet. Again, a cultural understanding of uh, communication in a, uh, a tribal environment is that uh, often those conversations, those explanations can be drawn out. And uh, those pauses do not mean that that person talking is, is giving you uh, an opportunity to, uh, to share what you want to share. They're they're formulating their next bullet point, so to speak. Um, so it's, it's very important to understand culturally how, how they, uh, these people communicate. Um, my friends, my neighbors, uh, uh, people that uh, I often have lunch with and, and listen and, and uh, laugh, often cry together, uh, pray together. And, uh, you know, I've had, uh, um, awesome uh, ceremonies. Um, um, people have come into my house and blessed my family. Uh, we've saged together and uh, that's unique and it helps us develop that partnership and that friendship. And I, when I say partnership, I want to say friendship because it's really that close family related uh, partnership with the tribes and friendship with the tribes uh, that has allowed um, me, Wydot, and uh, Heinrich to do the work we've done on Wind River. Um, next, uh, next slide, um, talking about emergency services a little bit. Um, 
I'll share a few things that, uh, you know, they are statistics, but they, they really uh, contribute to some of the issues with traffic safety on Wind River. Um, Fremont County, the fifth uh, largest county in the state. We don't have interstates in this part of the world. I'm about two and a half hours from Yellowstone Park in northwest Wyoming. You know, things that you've heard about uh, this part of the state probably is, um, you know, you've heard about Yellowstone, maybe Grand Teton National Park, uh, maybe Jackson Hole. I've hoped that you've heard about uh, Wind River and, uh, you know, the beautiful landscapes we have in northwest Wyoming. But we also have uh, um, about 5% of the crashes and about 8% of the fatalities in the state of Wyoming. Um, emergency services, great example of things that happen in our county that you might not see in other places. Um, and this is a quote that when Laura and I were putting this thing together, um, it's very difficult to get, uh, get an ambulance um, onto the reservation in many instances because of the, the large size, you know, the, the size of a county um, that we have, as I said, about the size of the state of Vermont. Um, and so what you'll often see is these uh, ambulances will sit at strategic places um, on and off the reservation throughout the day, often Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, um, you know, our, our most uh, prevalent time of the week for these crashes. And when a crash happens in a rural area, it, it is often faster to load the injured person in your own vehicle. And as I told Laura, haul ass to the hospital and lander and hope for the best because um, we live in such a rural area that it's it's very difficult to get that uh, on time, um, fast medical response uh, in these rural areas. And, uh, you know, and Wind River is probably one of the most rural areas of Wyoming. Um, so go ahead, Laura. About seven, 70 percent uh, of American Indians live in an area that is about one hour or more from a level one trauma center. And we only have one in our county that being in Lander, Wyoming, a, a town of about 7,000 uh, people uh, right off the uh, southern edge of the Wind River Reservation. Um, this is common across the country uh, um, that uh, these reservations are often in very rural areas. And so it's difficult to transport people to, to these level one trauma centers. Nationwide uh, emergency medical service units Average about seven minutes from the time of a 911 call to get on scene. Uh, uh, that median time on, on reservations in rural Wyoming, uh, rural Wind River Reservation, increases uh, um, out uh, way past uh, what's here, but that's a nationwide average of about 14 minutes in rural settings. Often an ambulance trip can take, you know, 30 minutes to someone's home on Wind River. and and then another 30 to 40 minutes back to the level one trauma center. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a challenge and that's why transportation is a very important thing. And, and you heard uh, Emeril LeBeau say in her video that transportation is really the lifeline of, uh, of life on the reservation. And so that has helped uh, YDOT um, to, um, work on safety messaging to get out there and do other work on Wind River. Go ahead, Laura. Enforcement is a is a key deal. Um, we have a multi-jurisdictional type of uh, enforcement on Wind River. Um, when I say that, uh, the reservation has uh, the Wind River Police Department, which is run by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, there's the uh, Fremont County Sheriff. Uh, that patrols the same areas, uh, Wyoming Highway Patrol. Um, these three agencies uh, get together, they train, and uh, so the sheriff can answer calls on Wind River. Um, the Wyoming Highway Patrol can, uh, can answer calls in a, uh, a support type uh, system along with BIA. So 
it works very well for helping to reduce fatal crashes um, due to impaired driving and seatbelt laws. And, and uh, these, uh, these three agencies and also local police departments in uh, uh, four different communities, including Riverton, where I live, and Lander, uh, Shoshone, um, they have come together to uh, create what's called the Fremont County DUI Task Force. And really, it's about education. We put a lot of information out before we have these um, um, task force events uh, over holiday weekends. The goal here is to, to find nobody that's uh, drunk, nobody that's under the influence of drugs, um, but yet to educate about seatbelt use, about child safety seats and other things. But uh, the DUI task force does find things out there. Um, most recent, uh, one of the most recent ops we had was during a brew fest, uh, which is a, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, it's a, uh, uh, you can pay $50 and get into these things and, uh, and drink all kinds of local, local brews, uh, other things, uh, uh, these brew masters come in from all over the region. And so we, we took advantage of the opportunity. Uh, we've created a safe ride partnership with uh, this local uh, uh, publicly funded uh, uh, bus company, uh, which has actually receives funds through NHTSA to do its work, uh, the Wind River Transportation Authority. And we provided safe rides during the Lander Brew Fest. But uh, police were also out, the DUI task force, and they made uh, traffic stops. They did find people who were impaired. They found people who were under the influence of controlled substances. Uh, they, they focused on speed a little bit because uh, people want to keep driving faster and faster. Um, they did issue a bunch of warnings and then Safe Ride gave a lot of people rides home. It was one of the most uh, um, successful events we've had for promoting the idea of safe rides around the edges of the Wind River Reservation. Uh, in 2022, as I said, in this very rural environment, um, uh, Fremont County, which includes Wind River, as I said earlier, uh, we had 10 fatal crashes with 11 fatalities. Um, that's in an area with uh, 40,000 people. Um, 114 uh, injury crashes with 140 injuries. A lot of property destruction only crashes. We have wildlife on our roads. Uh, we have uh, other things in the Single car run off the road uh, rollover continues to be the most common crash in Wyoming. And then uh, we had the seventh highest uh, a total of county crashes in Wyoming. But I'm, I'm happy to report some really positive things, and we'll talk about that as we get along. Um, YDOT has been very active um, with the tribes, uh, with the Wind River Intertribal Council, which is a... Uh, a collection of, of members of each business council of each tribe. They come together on issues that are common to the, uh, to the tribes in general, and transportation is one of those. Uh, we have rebuilt a, uh, several highways, including Wyoming 132, which is known as Blue Sky Highway, um, which goes between Lander and areas to the north that goes through Ethody which is a business center on the reservation. Um, we recently were able through a NHTSA grant to um, um, buy two digital message signs to promote seatbelt use and enforcement of the tribe's uh, um, 0.05 DUI law and to provide um, you know, safety messaging around schools, um, around uh, speed limits, all those things. Um, YDOT uh, officially owns those uh, digital message sign trailers, but uh, we have worked uh, hand in hand with the tribes. We've trained them. Uh, this is a slide, uh, uh, the current planner slash director for the Wind River Intertribal Council, DOT, uh, Winslow Friday. And uh, we did a training session and those uh, tribal um, message signs were right out on the road. And, and we decided to ask NHTSA if we could, uh, if we could 
fund these uh, messaging trailers through a highway safety grant. And, uh, and they said yes. And so we're very excited to be actively engaging um, drivers throughout Wind River with this uh, digital message approach, which is uh, um, something that I know the tribes are excited about too. And, and uh, you know, you're, you're working with uh, friends like Winslow Friday uh, to do positive things like this. And it's, a, it's been a great thing on Wind River. And I'm, I'm very, uh, uh, very humbled by this. Um, again, uh, important things to do is, is to develop these trust-based relationships. Um, always tell the truth when you're, when you're out there. And it's something that my grandpa, who was, you know, the rancher on the reservation, told me when I was a little kid. And that's, you know, he used to say, uh, you know, Ike, when you, uh, when you tell the truth, you never have to remember what you said. And I think that's such an important thing when you're working um, every day in your regular life, but also with uh, um, indigenous tribes and partners where trust is so important. Uh, listen to understand, um, work on the strengths um, that a, the tribal people are most proud of. And one of the strengths, and they're very proud of their transportation infrastructure, because as I said before, it really is the lifeblood of life on the reservation. Uh, goods and services, emergency management, uh, safe uh, transport of their children. Um, we have involved members of the business council and other things. Um, we had a great opportunity to bring the two tribal councils together and to, to get uh, BIA, Wind River Police Department's uh, help when we did a military exercise right on the edge of, of um, the Wind River Reservation. Uh, we landed a C-130. Uh, we landed a drone um, that you've heard about uh, all doing military work all over the world. We landed uh, two A-10 uh, warthogs on the highway. And uh, we had to use uh, tribal roads um, to make it a success as a detour around this piece of state highway, which is within a mile of the Wind River Reservation. And uh, by the way, those are the Wind River Mountains in the background. And as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. But uh, um, if, if it wouldn't have been for the two tribal councils working hand in hand with us, um, that uh, military exercise would have... Uh, would have not happened. And that uh, is something that is very important to the culture on the reservation, very patriotic, uh, very interested in uh, being involved in uh, the U.S. military. <clears throat> Excuse me, many of the tribal members have uh, are uh, veterans, and uh, we've used that in, in our in our efforts to promote uh, responsible driving, too, on the Wind River Reservation. So outcomes of our campaigns over the last, uh, I've been doing this for about 16 years. And then Laura and I, through uh, Heinrich and Spawny Dodd, have, have been working for the last 14 years on this, is that partnerships and trust-based friendships uh, are the norm. And it does not happen overnight. Um, one of my favorite stories to tell real quickly is, is, I've developed these friendships over time uh, through transportation and through our great working relationship. And I was sitting outside of a council meeting uh, waiting to get inside and, and you kind of feel like you've gotten there with friendships and you're continuing to work on those when you're, when you're sharing text messages back and forth with tribal members inside the council chambers. Well, I got in and this gentleman that had been sitting on this couch by me looks at me and he says, I've been here. And he pounds his fist on the table. I've been here for weeks and months trying to get in here. Why can't I get in there? And I said, well, you need to have some, some uh, respect and you need to have honor and trust and friendships. And you have to be patient and listen to understand. Um, 
again, uh, it's very important that the tribal leaders and members are active participants in creating this safety messaging. Um, discussions and design of highway construction and, and highway safety projects is ongoing, and we have actively engaged uh, the tribes on Wind River to tell us what the needs are out there. And then we continue to uh, declare war on impaired driving on and off the reservation because these are family members. Seatbelt use is improving um, on Wind River. Uh, these are, these are up-to-date statistics uh, coming from Fremont County. Um, this is a, a very in, interesting graphic. Um, and this is uh, the same period that we've been working on uh, DUI offenses, as you can tell, over the past uh, 10 years have dropped uh, 79%. Uh, we don't have some of the current years in there, but what we're finding is that our average BAC isn't really dropping. Uh, and I believe that we're finally, we're finally starting to impact um, the pros who are doing this activity um, with uh, our active um, uh, DUI efforts and life-saving efforts on Wind River. So um, that's a very positive thing. In conclusion, could you go back one slide, Laura? Um, in conclusion, uh, we continue to address those four E's on Wind River. Um, but I'll tell you what, success is measured by friendships, by trust, and our ability to listen. And so with that being said, I'll turn it over to Nicholas. Uh, thank you all for being here today. And um, hey, come visit us in Wyoming. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Laura, Maggie, Nez. Um, and thanks to all of you again. Um, I feel like we've learned a tremendous amount. This is a great body of information. Uh, we'll have this information readily available, the recording that we'll post about next week or so. Um, then we'll have um, some more information that we'll send out, and you can certainly follow us at ntsb.gov uh, or follow us on Twitter. We'll put that information at NTSB. Um, I know a lot was mentioned. Also, we heard the term repetition that there might be some repeating, but I've often learned um, that repetition, as they say, is the mother of learning, the father of action, which makes it the architect of accomplishment. So there's nothing wrong with a little repetition. Um, now, without further ado, I want to take a few questions. We have about eight minutes or so. Um, so I am going to tee up the first question here. Uh, there was one that was sent in. Um, this may be premature, it says. So I am not directing to a specific panelist, but I am sure hoping some of the panelists will speak more directly to how we who work with diverse urban environment and seek to better reach our Native American citizens and our cities can communicate. 71% of Native Americans live in cities now and perhaps don't have that strong and immediate connection with the tribal identity, or they might uh, love to share, um, hear, the, hear that question addressed. Would anyone like to address that for the panelists? I would be happy to jump in. Um, I think that that is a terrific question because we really have, by the very nature of where some of the speakers are located, we have focused more on reservations, but um, we're based in Denver. And so I can tell you that, you know, very, very large urban location. And what we have found to be particularly helpful um, with our work with the Colorado Department of Transportation, not only on the two reservations in the Four Corners area, but to also work with community serving nonprofits in Denver. The Denver Indy Fa Indian Family Services Center uh, immediately comes to mind. This is a nonprofit organization that strives to support all of our indigenous neighbors throughout the Denver metro area. So this is not nearly as tribe specifically focused, but instead those messages that we develop in partnership with the nonprofits are much more global in their messaging. So that gives us a chance to maybe talk about the importance of family, to talk about the importance of 
properly restraining your children. And again, not as tribal specific because there are 20, 30, 40 tribal members represented within their service area, but always remembering some of the things we talked about today that can be used in in a more generic fashion. And I hate to use the word generic because it's always still culturally relevant, but nonprofits can help you in urban areas. Thank you. Tashina, I know remember, I know you wanted to address that. I had some comments to that too as well. Go ahead. Thank you for your question. So um follow up to what Laura said. Uh yes. So especially in the larger cities, like she said, Denver, um, there you would be surprised the native presence there is. So one of the things about uh, Native communities is that we are very um, heavily community-based. So, and you would, um, there's a lot of alliances. So in Cody's presentation, he mentioned that there was a type of tribal allow, uh, alliance where generally how this works is there's different representatives from different tribes that all meet together to address issues on certain stuff. So there are a lot of organizations like that that exist that have representation from a, a especially um, tribes that have a smaller population where they can all work together, they can pool funding and they can um, help to address these challenges. So there, there are a, a number of um, alliances like that that you may be able to work with. And there's also, um, for this topic specifically with talking about transportation safety, um, you know, that also aligns with um, health. So naturally, so there are a lot of urban Indian health um, places. It's just a matter of finding out which um, like tribal alliances there are, which even nonprofits, as Laura said, and which urban Indian health centers that there are in your area. So those have um, a good representation of the different tribes that are in that area, but also um, like <laughs> there's a joke that Navajos are everywhere. So wherever you're at, there's good, you might meet a Navajo person. So even if we're not in the Southwest, even if you're on the East Coast, up in the Northwest, you you will find a diverse a diverse, um, um, diverse people from all over that are native. So there are opportunities out there. It's just a matter of finding it. And one thing that I would say is if you, in general, this might not work for everybody, but if you have a good relationship with somebody who is native, um, you might be able to just ask them like, Hey, I'm, I'm in the city, like for example, Denver and you can ask them like, okay, what, you know, what native community serving organizations do you, are, do you know of? And then you can um, find out information that way. Cause yeah, especially like uh, community leaders or people who are active in the community usually know that information because they often serve as an unpaid community connector. And they're like, oh yeah, there's this. And they'll send their native relatives, like go over to the health center, go over the community center. So there, there's ways to find that and make partnerships with them. And there's also um, like the tribal alliances. They, um, there's also been communications that are good at um, showing people in those that represent the tribal nations around that city. They show good images of uh of people who look like us. So it the, you can still be culturally relevant in cities, even if you're off the reservation. It's very doable. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Maggie, did anyone want to weigh on that? I'll stop. I'll go to the next question. And I, I just, for Sheena, I think another example would be like the five civilized tribes of Oklahoma. 
you know, where they, and they have quarterly meetings and have all kinds of activities. And so we were lucky to be invited to the quarterly meeting just in July. So I know I'm, I'm up on uh, time, but I want to ask one more question here. Uh, how did you or uh, engage with tribal youth to develop campaigns? What are the best strategies for communicating and engaging with young drivers, teen drivers specifically? Um, anyone want to take that? Uh, yeah, I'd be glad to speak to that a little bit. Um, we we started out our work about 15 years ago talking to uh, young people who were very good athletes. And so we started using that athletic uh, move to get into the schools. And uh, these were, these are people that, you know, are, are out there on Thursday nights and Friday nights and Saturday nights uh, representing their school. And, and so we, we started there and as, as this thing has grown, um, we've enlisted the, um, many other students in the high school and that, that got us the foot in the door. And, and I think, uh, people watch what's happening and, and they, and they want to be part of it. And, and it kind of builds in a viral sense, uh, off of it. And so getting into those schools, developing relationships with, uh, the cultural leaders within the schools is a very important thing to do. I think in a rural sense, and also in an urban sense, I'm, uh, you know, the that's the future right there, and and uh, these are going to be the next leaders. And so, developing that uh, through families and also through schools is very important. And we've had a lot of success uh, getting young people advocacy going uh, that way. Awesome. Uh, if anyone else wanted to chime in, if not, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. You can certainly, if you had a question and you wanted to direct it to any of the panelists, feel free to email me as well. Um, you have my information, uh, email, and I'll make sure I get those questions so we can do follow up for each of uh, to each of the panelists. Um, again, thanks to all of the panelists, to all of you who joined today's webinar to discuss communicating and connected to Native American communities. It, it has been an eye opener. They say knowledge is power, but it's power it is as powerful as you utilize it. So uh, let's not let this knowledge go to waste. As we in the advocacy community learn and grow together and we become more intentional about communicating and connecting with underserved communities, I do hope that we are looking to the next steps. Uh, you have given us, the panelists here today have given us a lot of food and a lot of good foundation to view the landscape from. We have not solved anything today, but we have shared our efforts and approaches. And I know that you have been working on with many of the liaison or the information you've provided. So I thank you all again for sharing with me and, and more importantly, with all of the attendees on how to get the job done. Once again, to our panelists and to all of you, thanks for joining us. The recording will be posted out in a week or so. It will also be transcribed as a transcript, and we'll put that on our website. Uh, for more information on our various social media channels, follow us on at NTSB, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, any one of those. Again, we're grateful for your time and for the opportunity to share with you today. Have a great day and a safe evening.